And this next piece um, is actually a lyric essay, so if you're not familiar with the form, it's a hybrid between um, an essay and a poem. Um, and it's, I usually write about art, um, and a lot of times about abstract expressionist painters. Um, and so this is um, after the Mark Rothko exhibit that was at the CMA last year. I gave myself the challenge of, um, usually I'll go to a museum and uh, write a poem about art, and so I gave my challenge to go to the um, exhibit and write an essay about the exhibit. So um, this is called An Ocean Existing Somewhere Without Us, and it goes between um, uh, me being at the art gallery and also just me remember, um, kind of talking about things I remember, so between memory and, and gallery time. Um, Okay, I think that's all you need to know about this. Uh, this one's called, oh, and it's after, I'll sort of tell you uh, when I'm talking about another painting. Uh, so this is after the painting, here are a couple words. I am still not certain I am in the right gallery. Though all of the signs for the Rothko exhibit lead to Gallery 9, and the plaques on the wall reassure me that these are paintings by the abstract expressionist painter, Mark Rothko. But this is not how I know Rothko these mythical creatures and figures dancing in surrealistic step, these totemic birds dismembered and disfigured parts of creatures with wings. An eagle sits in the middle of the painting. His golden body is barrel, his golden body is barrel chested and plucked like a Thanksgiving turkey. His feathers float above him like a cape trying to find its body. Above the eagle, a butterfly and a dragonfly float in reverence to a swirling sun. From the plaque, I learned that this trio, the eagle, the butterfly, the dragonfly, represents what remained consistent in Rothko's work, sets of threes. What I do recognize of his work is the landscape behind the mythical creatures, the three, the three horizontal panels of color, lilac, sand, and sea foam. I imagine the figures of the creatures losing definition, losing shape, until they fade into the background, becoming what I love of Rothko's work his resistance to particular form and figure. At seven years old, I, couldn't f I could feel things changing, but I could not picture them. There was not enough archived in my mental Rolodex of images to fathom what moving to the West would be like. To me, everything west of Chicago was a snowy blur on the TV set, and I believe the closer we got to Colorado, the clearer the picture would get. But my parents, not my parents, sorry, I don't know, that's why I just came out. Um, <laughs> but my parents told me we were going to live in the Rocky Mountains. I imagined we were going to live in a cave carved out of the hillside. That my new life would take place in an underground lair. I remember driving to the mouth of Cold Creek Canyon for the first of what would be thousands of times and watching the landscape change from flatlands to foothills. It was the only time I entered anticipating seeing people emerging from the ground. Untitled 1948. During our move to Los Angeles, I watched my husband David at a gas pump in Nevada. He sat propped on a post and stared at a neighboring field. In the wind, the trash hovered over the ground like inhabitants, creatures running around frantically, the leftovers foraging for a place to stick in a barren land. The way he sat outside the car reminded me of my predicament, how I always wanted him sitting near me, looking a little insecure or challenged by some thought, yet I never wanted him to bring that in the car where we would be breathing the same air. A woman walks up behind me and says, I like his colors. I often feel like when I'm trying to make sense of my marriage, the things that don't fit are shoved off and thrown away. By making sense of it, I leave out the colors between the colors. Blue becomes only a color for the iris, the sky, his raw denim jeans. Blue is resolved in the form of an object. Blue has a line which you cannot cross. Blue even has an emotion, a cliche in which you cannot escape. We cannot see the three figures of landscape in this painting. Rothko turns us onto our bellies and gives us the eagle's aerial view. Here, blue is breaking the painting the way bodies of water break earth. It interrupts any sort of warmth we feel from blood orange, wheat, salmon, and chocolate to remind us that we can not only feel one thing at a time. A painting cannot only make us happy or sad or bored. It 
must also, also make us something else, something its opposite, something completely different, something of another time, another map altogether. Number 18, 1948. Custard and eggshell smeared down the side of the canvas first before it can be a splotch. We must, sorry, we have to be wet paint, already dry, before we can be a splotch. As a splotch, part of us gets taken away. When I left Chicago, I left behind my best friend and cousin Danielle. We were born two months apart. We lived two blocks away from each other. Our names differed by two letters. The beginning of our lives braided in a way that made them indistinguishable from one another. Over the years, I would discover how hard my move was for her. It was never very hard for me, maybe because I was going somewhere new or because I was the one getting a second chance. I enjoyed, or when I settled in Colorado, I, I appreciated my refuge, my sheltered mountain life. I enjoyed that the trouble we encouraged in each other was reserved for vacations. On my visits to Illinois, we would sneak out and take the train into the city. She would visit me and we would drive through the mountains, smoking cigarettes and listening to Fiona Apple on repeat. I want to make a mistake. I want to do it on purpose. The first time she met David, the three of us went to Stanley Lake Reservoir to walk around the mud flats. We sat on a log, our feet color covered in clay from the wet ground. I watched the ground consume us as I felt the pressure to reconcile my two lives. I felt both places at once, the Midwest and the West. It became a hazy frame around my sense of belonging. Here we have color surrounding an empty space, but it's only an empty space because it is not color, or perhaps a color I cannot describe as colorful, because it is mauve, or some other color I distrust, knowing I might not be able to make it again. I might, not have, I might never be able to replicate the feelings I once had, how are we supposed to understand our feelings as we understand knowledge, as something that can be restated? And even if we can come so close to the same color, the original is always changed by light, by oxygen, by the oil in our skin. Sacrificial Moment, 1945. This painting is what it feels like to be in a conch shell. I, you can feel the mechanism making the music of the ocean. Pins so small, the lamelle don't recognize them as the notes. Instead, it plays the sound of a tide swelling and receding at the same time. Held to the ear, it is a, a whispered reminder that there is an ocean somewhere. In the, in the arid west, a shell is a reminder that there is an ocean existing somewhere without us, somewhere further west. I taught David how to drive a manual car in two days so we could take turn driving, turns driving my car to California. He sprung he crawled on every on-ramp in too low of a gear. I white-knuckled the seatbelt buckle and the engine hummed loudly as he sped away, sped onto the highway in too low of a gear. I stayed silent while he was in the driver's seat, ignoring missed exits and wrong gears because I learned it was best if he figured out his mistakes for himself. He had researched a place to stop in Cayman, Arizona, an old hotel that had been restored by an artist couple. We passed abandoned buildings along the historic Route 66, 66 as we searched for the hotel in the heat of a quiet town. The map directed us to a building with crumbling white columns and boarded windows. I let him figure out on his own that the project was never started, that the picture on the website was a rendering of a building that never existed. 